please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Sing praises to the Lord, O faithful ones, and give thanks to God's holy name. For God's answer is but for a moment. God's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. God has turned our mourning into dancing. God has taken off our sackcloth and clothed us with joy. Let our souls praise God and not be silent. O Lord, our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Family of faith, the proof of God's love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, having faith in him, we can come to confession, not trembling in fear, but trusting in God's limitless grace. So let us confess to God and one another using the unison prayer of confession that's in your bulletin or on your screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name.
Family of faith, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We may think that something we did or didn't do can separate us from God's love, but friends, that is a lie. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You are deeply loved, and you are enough. Amen. Now, as you forgiven and reconcile people, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning, online friends. Peace of Christ be with you. And a special shout out to my family who is online. Peace of Christ be with you. Hello, online family. May the peace of Christ be with you. We're so happy you're here. All right, at this point in the service, I'd like to invite any pre K to second graders to go with Miss Jamie and Miss Shannon to Children's Church. All right, so we have a blessing for them and they have a blessing for us. We say to them, may God be with you there. May God be with you here. It's okay to be shy sometimes. <laughs> Friends, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ on this first Sunday after Easter here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in the heart of New York City. Whether you are worshiping in person or joining us online, you bless us with your presence. Welcome to worship. This is a community for you, and all are welcome. If you're new to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, there are a couple of things you should know. First, when we say all are welcome, we mean it. We don't all look alike. We don't all think alike. Still, we share a common purpose. We are committed to following Jesus Christ. We seek to make Christ's love and hospitality tangible in our lives, and we like to share it with the world. Second Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church extends far beyond the walls of this room. We have a big place in our hearts for our live streaming friends and extended family of the congregation. And to celebrate this, I want to give a shout out to worshipers in Missoula, oh I got this, Bay City, Michigan, Durham, North Carolina, and Montreal, Canada. Ryan, I think we got a Canada fan club for you over there. Online friends, if you're watching on YouTube, please take a moment to type in the chat where you're coming from today. We see you and we share the peace of Christ with you. We also want to extend a special welcome to all of you who are here for the first time, whether it's in person or online. So would you do me a favor? If you're a visitor here in the sanctuary, would you please stand and allow us to welcome you? welcome. To help us connect with you, please find this red welcome card in your pew, fill it out, and leave it in the offering plate in the service. And for our new covers on live stream, please fill out the connect card with the QR code that should be showing up on your screen right now. Also, visitors, if you are interested in a tour to learn about the history and architecture of this church, meet docent Janice Haas after the service in the back of the sanctuary, and she will be waving a sign that says, the tour starts here. You cannot miss it. And today, we also want to offer up our prayers and good wishes to the Fifth Avenue young adults who are attending the fire retreat at Holmes Camp and Retreat Center up in the Hudson Valley. God's blessing to you all, and we will see you next week. 
For our online campus, you can join Reverend Nally Owens Pike um, at our hybrid coffee hour at 1215. The link is in the video description below. Now there's so many fellowship events happening in the life of the church. You can see all of it on pages 10 and 11 of today's bulletin, but here are some highlights. Credo. This April, you are invited to join us for Credo, our annual education series focused on the foundations of Christian theology. Often after the sermon, we will do an affirmation of faith that comes from our book of confessions. Yes, we have a book of confessions. And this year for our Credo series, our themes are the modern creeds. Groups of faithful people sat down and wrote these creeds, and the Presbyterian Church USA has said yes to these particular creeds. And in this year's Credo, we are going to examine some of them. Today, Jonah is doing double duty, preaching and starting off our Credo series with the Confession of 1967. Next week, the Reverend Nally Owens Pike will present on the Belhar Confession, which is one of my favorites. Um, a little fun thing about the Belhar, it originated from Dutch Reformed Mission Church in South Africa in 1982, addressing issues of racial segregation and emphasizing unity, reconciliation, and justice within the Christian community. It's fascinating stuff. These statements of faith are incredible conversation for us. So join us today and the next three Sundays after church in Bonnell Hall. This will coexist with coffee hour, so come on up and get some snacks. And then make sure to listen to our Crossroads podcast as Jamie Staley, our Director of Christian Education, meets with our presenters and will do a recap and reflection on the week's creed. Our second announcement is Fifth Avenue Serves. While the church offers life-changing service opportunities throughout the year, Fifth Avenue Serves is our congregation's annual day of service. This year, it will take place on Saturday, May 4th, and service opportunities include Meals on Heels, Search and Care, Hands Along the Nile, the Urban Outreach Center, the Farm Minary in Princeton, New Jersey, and even a service site in the D.C. Washington area for our members who are in the DMV area. I just learned what DMV stands for. It's not just the Department of Motor Vehicles. D.C., Maryland, Virginia. I was so confused. <laughs> so for our DMV friends, service opportunity for you. Um, and if you're not in that area, there you can also assemble a care package for our unhoused guests that come to this church. You can send packages here. Details and registrations can be found at fapc.org slash serves. Now, last but certainly not least, the women's ministry here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church is hosting a Saturday lunch out in the town for women on Saturday, April 13th. Pastor Sarah will split the list into small groups of five or six people and each given a restaurant reservation. It sounds like a blast. I hope at least one group is getting tacos. Um, but if you'd like to sign up, just go to fapc.org slash women. All right, take a deep breath with me. I invite you to open your hearts as we continue to worship our God.
Please pray with me. Living God, open our hearts and minds to the wisdom of your word today. Silence in us all voices but your own, that we may hear and grounded in hope, walk the path of faith. Amen. During the season of Lent, Fifth Avenue heard stories about Jesus, David, Ruth, Paul, a hemorrhaging woman, and the crowds. We explored how they responded to turmoil and adversity out of their faith and learned about sacred resilience. Last week, we reached the series Crescendo with a look at a conjunction. We were reminded of how but performs its linking function with a twist. It connects two phrases while signaling a change. And in that change is hope. Having journeyed through Lent and the stories of resilience, it was wonderful celebrating that hope last Sunday. An empty cross from Friday was flowered with blooms. This sanctuary was filled with a diverse community calling out to one another, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. The choir, like the angels of heaven, belted out resounding hallelujahs. And there was even a festive parade of Easter bonnets right outside church after this service. And to top it off, as I experienced it, the chilly morning turned sunny and marvelous by the afternoon. To me, it was a glorious day. However, the lovely weather of Easter Sunday quickly gave way to more dour conditions. A rainy Tuesday and Wednesday left floodwaters in certain areas of my town. After pausing to lift up a prayer for those affected by the worst earthquake in Taiwan since 1999, on Wednesday, on Friday, I, among many other East Coasters, experienced my first earthquake and aftershock. On Thursday, a nor'easter dumped a foot and a half of heavy, wet snow in parts of New England, causing power outages to about three quarters of a million residents, residences and businesses. Also, in the past week, tornadoes touched down and tore through Oklahoma, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Georgia. On Monday, we will have a solar eclipse with New York among the states in the path of totality. By Passover, at the end of April, there will be a plague of locusts. <laughs> More specifically, trillions, trillions of cicadas will appear in the Midwest and Southeast regions of the United States. It's fascinating to go look up about Rude 8 and 13 that comes over 13 and like 17 years and it will be a massive event which will not happen again for another 221 years. Additionally, COVID-19 is still with us and war continues to ravage the world. Looking at these occurrences, we wouldn't even have to squint to wonder if these aren't signs of the apocalypse. I mean, what happened to glorious Easter Sunday? You know, just last week. I mean, isn't the tomb empty? In the face of what's going on in this crazy world, what does it mean that Jesus is risen? Let's, let's listen in on the gospel of John, chapter 21, to hear more about the life in the weeks, in the early weeks after the first Easter. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and Jesus showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, 
and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone to shore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's narrative gives us a glimpse into the life of the disciples after the resurrection. Let me sum up how we got here. On Easter morning, Mary Magdalene breaks the news about the empty tomb to Peter and John. The pair runs over to the tomb to see for themselves and discover Mary was telling the truth. But they did not retell the message shared by Mary. Rather, they went home, leaving the cemetery confused. That very evening, the disciples were afraid and so were gathered behind locked doors. By then, Mary preached about her encounter with the risen Christ. Jesus appears among them, showing them his hands and his side. They receive a commissioning from Christ to go out into the world as he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. The disciples ecstatically share the story, retelling it to one another, and especially to Thomas, who missed it. You know how like, you love to rub it into those who missed out on something? Oh, you should have been there, man. It was awesome. And maybe, and maybe that's why Thomas just got sick of it, and, and he declared his refusal to believe them unless he too touches Jesus' hands inside. So a week later, that would be today for us, Jesus once again appears among them, though the doors were still locked. And he fulfills Thomas's conditions for his belief. That was the second visit. Today, John gives us an ambiguous after these things to introduce the third of Jesus's visit to the disciples. We can deduce the visit fell in a period between 8 and 40 days after the resurrection, since the second visit happened a week after Easter, seven days, and Jesus ascended into heaven on the 40th day. Most scholars agree that chapter 21 of John's gospel is an epilogue. The Gospel of John could very well have ended with chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, which go, 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That would have been a great ending. But I am thankful for that additional chapter. The purpose of an epilogue is to reveal the fates of the characters after the story ends. We love epilogues. Marvel got us hooked on it. When fade to black, I'm like, oh, come on, man. You know, where's that next scene? Oh, where's the second one? Where's that third one? So, the story that we read was amazing. God so loved the world and showed how much through God's Son, Jesus Christ, who was crucified, died, and resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah! Amen! Fade to black. But what about Peter? Peter followed Jesus around every day for three years. The Gospels record him as being bold. I mean, he asked Jesus to call him out to walk on water with him. I mean, he declared that Christ is the Messiah. Peter was in Jesus' inner circle along with John and James. Some would even argue that he was Jesus' best friend. I mean, What a cool title. What a cool relationship. Peter saw the empty tomb with his own eyes. He saw and interacted with the risen Jesus on Easter evening, and he did so again a week later. Yet, even after all the pre- and post-resurrection adventures and experiences with Jesus— There is no trace of Peter transforming into the super apostle that we know him to be within the early weeks of Easter. To me, it's important to hear and understand this because through it, we might find hope. Sometime after Jesus' second appearance, Peter decides to go fishing and six other disciples join him. Maybe you've heard this interpreted as a failure of sorts for the disciples, accusing them of backsliding, as if the crew went back to their old ways after Jesus called them to be fishers of people. (gasps) How could they do that? Don't be like that, cautionary tale. I'm not so sure I would agree. To me, it makes sense Peter would go fishing. After all, Jesus' earthly ministry concluded, and those who were financially supporting him likely stopped when Jesus was crucified and the disciples went into hiding. I mean, who was going to collect the offering? But that did not mean the bill stopped. Peter was a fisherman by vocation, and we know he was married because the Gospels tell us of Peter's mother-in-law, Fishing paid the bills, and so it is reasonable that he and the others return to their trade for that purpose. For fishing in the Sea of Galilee, nighttime by torchlight was best. Maybe repetition is key, and the long break made the fishermen rusty with the casting of nets. Instead of that beautiful circle, it was like, oh, I'll try again. Because they toiled all night, and alas, it was in vain. They caught nothing. As the day broke, a man on shore called out and instructed them to toss the nets to the right side of the boat. But this was not unusual, because people on the shore often had the better view of the shoals of fish through the clear waters. And so with their nets filled with fish, John knew it was Jesus, but he didn't act. If you recall, 
John and Peter had a foot race to the gravesite, and John actually beat Peter there. John could have been the first one in the empty tomb, but he waited for Peter to go in first. You know how you do. Oh, you first, man. You, you go. In a similar move, John knows that is Jesus on the shore, but he first tells Peter. After grabbing his tunic without hesitation, Peter dove into the water to meet Jesus while the others hauled in the big catch of fish to the shore. Peter's reaction adds to the evidence that he didn't backslide. Vocationally speaking, Peter just had the catch of a lifetime. That one deal, that one thing that's going to set you up. This is it. I'm done. But he easily leaves that behind to greet Jesus. To me, through his actions, Peter demonstrates love and faith to Christ. But was Peter resilient? I found it difficult to take this story and hold it up as a model of resilience. So church, do as Peter did because that's resilience and we want to be like him. If anything, this story seems to me like the opposite because Peter had all the reasons to be resilient and yet I don't think he showed it. I think Peter jumped into the water to beat the other disciples and meet Jesus at the beach because something was bothering him and he wanted to address it privately with Jesus because Peter wasn't ready the first two times Jesus appeared to the disciples. But as he got to the shore and walked over to Jesus, Peter froze. He saw something and Peter did not say what he wanted to say before the others arrived. And so Jesus instructs Peter to go and bring back some fish that they just caught. And Peter does. What was it that froze Peter? A charcoal fire. The smell and sight brought him back to the haunting memory of the night when Peter pulled up to a different charcoal fire to warm himself up when he answered the question, did I not see you in the garden with him? And after answering, he heard the rooster crow. All Peter wanted to say was, I'm sorry, Jesus. But circumstances kept getting in the way. It is difficult to deny the energy and joy that was in the air here on Easter Sunday. But if we could take a moment and just kind of like, you know, acknowledge that, but just kind of start looking within, underneath the, the whole like warm, mushy, good feels, and, and kind of let your heart speak and your spirit speak. Was there something in your heart or spirit that made you feel like maybe, just maybe, you missed it? The, the season of Lent was meant to be a time of fasting, introspection, self-reflection, and preparation to help us deeper understand and connect with the life and passion of Christ. But did you instead find yourself busy dealing with all that life was throwing at you? I mean, we wanted to focus, we wanted to grow, but we got distracted by many things. We wanted to be committed, faithful, giving, and kind, but struggled to live up to our hopes and expectations. After this sermon series on resilience, were you asking, how come I'm not resilient? What I miss? For Peter and for us, we are often not resilient. The voices of our guilt and shame are too loud for us to ignore. They get the best of us and stymie us, preventing us from acting in faith. 
But the good news is Jesus continues to give opportunities by inviting us to and healing us through the fire. That's right. Jesus does two things. First, he invites us to the fire where he already has a meal prepared to feed us. The command Jesus gave to Peter to get some fish in the boat was a grace. It was an invitation to bring whatever gift, whatever ability, whatever resources you have to a feast that is already prepared for you. Jesus had already cooked fish and bread ready. It's not like Jesus was like, I got the pot, I got the fire, go get the fish and we'll make it a thing. He already had the meal ready. He was like, oh, yeah, let's bring, bring some more stuff. In other words, Jesus did not need the fish that Peter was to bring. Rather, he gladly accepts that which we will freely bring. And even if we do not have anything, it's okay because Jesus already has it prepared. As my colleague, the Reverend Warner Ramirez, continues to tell us and always says, and I love to hear, you are enough. For Jesus, you are enough. You don't need to bring anything because he has enough and he has more than enough for all. This allows us to break free from the false phrases that begin with, we must do blank, I must do blank, I must do it. Or without Jesus, I mean, without us, Jesus can't. Without me doing it, Jesus can't. We need only put our faith in Jesus, who has done it all on our behalf. Second, Jesus heals us through the fire. In John for Everyone, N.T. Wright comments on the two fires. First, from the night Peter denied Jesus, writing, Think back to the smell of that fire, wafting through the chilly April air. Think of Peter going out in shame, angry with himself, knowing that Jesus knew. Knowing that the beloved disciple knew. Knowing that God knew. And hearing the next day what had happened to Jesus. Not even the resurrection itself could wave a magic wand and get rid of that memory. Nothing could except revisiting it and bathing it in God's own healing. And shifting to the one on the beach, he continues, the charcoal fire is the start of it. And it seems from the conversation in the next section that Jesus planned it that way. And that's what Jesus does. He heals Peter by sitting and eating next to him and then talking to him next to a charcoal fire. Following the healing from the beach fire conversation with Jesus, which is not covered in today's passage, but follows it, Peter's resilience grows. Eventually, he became so resilient that Peter fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus foretold about him, that he would go where he does not want to go and ultimately die as a martyr. Jesus nurtures resilience in our faith life by providing a safe space of forgiveness for if and when we fail. Confessing our sins regularly and embracing the assurance of pardon allows us to practice, experience, and believe it. Then we get to go out and try to live it again and again. At the end of February, my family, we had a chance to go to Lake Placid for a hockey tournament, and so we did. 
This sounds like a platitude, but the results did not reflect the play of the team. But seriously, it was really good to see the strides and development in their play as individuals and as a team. One of my favorite moments came out of the special shootout competition during the midpoint of the tournament. One skater and one goalie would represent each team in the shootout. And because we had so many kids, we had to figure out a way to be fair about that. So our coach put all of the player sticks in a pile on the ground and then blindfolded himself and then he picked a stick and that would be the rep. And it was Harvey's. He was thrilled. Eight teams. Each skater would take three shots against the random opponent's goalie. Best scores from two rounds wins. His excitement mixed with nervousness. I hadn't seen him in many shootout situations, so I didn't know how he'd fare. But what I do know is that he has one of, if not the strongest shot on our team. And I reminded him of that. You got this. You have the strongest shot on the team. Just let it rip and show them. And that's what he did. He let loose three hard and impressive shots. But they didn't go in. I could see the pressure he felt in his body language as he battled disappointment. Then he composed himself for the second round. The four shot flew and the bang from the puck hitting the glass was jolting. Woo! Miss. The fifth puck hit the goalie's mask. Whoosh! And we're like, oh my gosh, is he gonna live? Miss. Each miss weighed heavier and heavier, but each shot was harder and faster than the previous. The sixth and final shot got an extra oomph, I'm guessing from, you know, desperation. Please, God! And it flew faster than the goalie could react, going past his glove and made a loud bing! As it hit the crossbar, eliciting collective oohs and ahs. Harvey's shoulder slumped. And he had to stay out there on the center ice as the rest of the competition played out. It was best of two wins, but they kept tying and they kept going and going. It was long. And he had to stay out there. I imagine he replayed the missed shots over and over in his head. Like I said, it felt long for me. I don't even know how it must have been for him. When it was over, I saw tears in his eyes. But I was nothing but smiles. I was so proud. I mean, all the parents and players witnessed the strength and zip in his shots, and I tried to tell him. But it seemed of little consolation to my son. And it's just... I don't know, I just wanted to take him and hug him and, and just hug away all the hurt and pain, you know, just take it away magnetically, parent power to, to make it go away and make it all better. But you know, something happened. After that competition, Harvey's play was different. It was more intense, more focused. I don't know, somehow the chemistry of the pressure, desire, and disappointment brought about improvement? I mean, he was stronger. I mean, he was more bold to take those shots that the coaches kept telling him, take it, you got a good shot, take it. And he would, and may even made some. I don't know, he came out, dare I say, more resilient? 
During that weekend, we had a conversation about being clutch in sports situations. I asked him, hey, how, does someone become, well, how do you think someone becomes more clutch? And Harvey responded by saying, by practicing? I was like, I didn't say no right away, but I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. That's not wrong. But I think it's more accurate to say with more opportunities. To be clutch, one needs to expose be exposed to chances to be clutch. One needs to feel the pressure and be given a chance to overcome, go through it, or just simply survive it. It helps knowing that in failure, there will be a good group of teammates and coaches that will offer encouragement and solace. Peter's story teaches us something similar. We can't just think it and pray our way to resilience. We must go through experiences that make us more resilient. And those are always unwanted and difficult. But Jesus will always be there by the fire with a meal prepared and an encouraging word to help us get back on our feet and cheer us on. And thanks be to God for that Easter hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit to join me in lifting up the affirmation of faith from the Confession of 1967 found in your bulletin and on your screens. The new life does not release us from conflict with unbelief, pride, lust, fear. We still have to struggle with disheartening difficulties and problems. Nevertheless, as we mature in love and faithfulness in our life with Christ, we live in freedom and good cheer bearing witness on good days and evil days, confident that the new life is pleasing to God and helpful to others. Amen.
Friends, you may be seated. As we turn now to a time of prayer, please join me in finding your feet flat on the floor and taking a deep breath together. Tuning our hearts now as we pray. Oh, Holy One, listening God, we lift to you now the prayers of your people. God of new life, we give thanks for the glory of your presence in our worship, that no matter where we are, you see fit to draw us together in community. Knit us together and teach us to serve each other as you taught your disciples, trusting you will feed us, trusting you will be with us even when we least expect it. And like your disciples, O oh God, when we draw up empty nets expecting nourishment, help to steady our faith and direct our paths toward your living waters. Turn our hearts towards the bursting of new life in our midst in this season, this season of Easter, resurrection, and spring. Point us towards the buds of new leaves, towards the softly falling cherry blossoms, towards the birds who hop among new grass. Turn our eyes to you, O oh God. In each springtime signal that new life rises after death. Let these two be a reminder to us of our calling to be stewards to the beauty and the thriving of your creation. Through all of the phases and conditions and extremes of our earth, empower our elected leaders and all of us to act with courageous and hopeful action. Not just for we who live today, but for the generations to come. In this Easter season, we celebrate the miracle and the mystery of our risen Christ. Let us see resurrection in our midst, O Lord, and grant us the courage we need to work towards that miracle of resurrection here on earth. Grant us life after fearful diagnosis or health scare. Grant us renewal where it's needed in our relationships and professional lives. Grant us lasting, true peace in all places of conflict and war. Holy One, you call on us to see beyond our distances and see our neighbor truly as ourselves. We pray you help us in times of division to cease all our separations across borders, bars or walls beyond religion, race or politics, may we act as though we know our suffering and our joy are bound up to our neighbors. We pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are are gifts from God. From our life to our breath, our friendships and our financial resources, God has blessed us. We give now not as though we can pay God back, but we give out of gratitude. One of the ways that this church uses your gifts is to support the work of our mission partner, Hands Along the Nile. Hands Along the Nile has a three-part mission— to create lasting relationships between American and Egyptian communities, to increase cross-cultural understanding, and to improve the quality of life for the most impoverished members of Egyptian society. Through this mission partnership, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church supports the Zabaline people, who are Coptic Christians that describe themselves as the garbage pickers of Cairo. Zabaline women and girls make their living by fashioning 
gifts and crafts into creative pieces that they sell to support themselves and their families and local schools. This is just one example of the way that your gifts to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church help to further God's work in our world. During the offertory anthem, officers will pass the plates to accept your gifts and any connect cards. So if you're new and would like to connect with us, you can get that card ready now. You can also make a secure offering online using the QR code printed on the back of your bulletin or found on your screen. We thank you for your generosity today and all days.
praise you for your goodness and your majestic glory, which shines on and through all of us as images of you. We thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us from our relationships to our financial resources. We are grateful that you are always with us and for us in times of joy and sadness. We offer these gifts both as individuals and as the diverse collective community of which we are a part of here at FAPC. In these anxious and isolating times, may these resources not only bring help, but also hope and connection to those in need. Send us, send us out this week to our cities, our workplaces, and our homes to help bring your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Family of faith, Jesus invites us to sit by him at the fire and eat, reminding us that we are not defined by our mistakes so we can be sent to share the same message with others. May the peace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>